Hey everyone, welcome to back to day three of Bitwise, where we build a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, following on from yesterday, first thing I want to cover is that um, I, I, I wrote in the overview that I would assign homework, but I hadn't actually uh, assigned it and gone through it. So uh, I, I posted a note in the uh, in the YouTube comments and also updated the streams.md in the GitHub uh, to reflect it. But in case you haven't seen it, uh, just wanted to point out that it's there now. And uh, it's basically combined reading and implementing a simple expression parser. Uh, and then there's a bunch of extra credit for people who are already old hands at parsing and maybe want to push a little bit further. All right, um, and for today, we're more or less just gonna continue where we left off. I do wanna cover a, a few practical things. Um, I just switched today to a multi-monitor setup. So now that we'll be using Visual Studio and, and other apps uh, sort of back and forth, uh, I'm using Display Capture, but can still kind of keep stuff separated on my other monitor so it doesn't interfere with the, with the workflow. And um, uh, in addition, a bunch of people expressed concern that, um, you know, I, I, try, I try to keep the main video of reasonable length. I mean, one, one, in, one to one and a half hours per day is already very long. Uh, and so for the sort of after stream, um, I thought that, you know, it would be less intimidating if the main video was not too long, but then still have the ability to go over time for people who wanted to hang out or maybe, you know, watch the, the Twitch archive sort of short term, but not really treat that as a long term uh, kind of thing, like, a, a, like not uploading it to YouTube, for example, or archiving it permanently. But a bunch of people said they, um, they really want to be able to, to see those potentially arbitrarily long after streams um, sessions. So but what I'm going to do is I'm going to still try to keep the main video to, you know, one, one between one and two hours, uh, depending on what a natural stopping point is. And then I will stop recording and restart recording. And so we'll just have uh, two separate video slices. And that way I can have, you know, YouTube playlists for just the main sequence, but I can still have um, those videos on YouTube as well in a separate playlist for people who have infinite amounts of time to watch stuff. Um, so hopefully <clears throat> that solves that problem. In addition, uh, a bunch of people have expressed uh, wanting a forum of some sort. And uh, right now, you know, we just have basically YouTube comments, which are a terrible format, uh, Twitch chat, which is, you know, fine for live streaming, and, uh, uh, and the Discord, which is very active. Um, but maybe pretty low signal to noise if you just want questions answered uh, concisely. Uh, and on that note, uh, one thing we did on the Discord yesterday was we split out the general kind of Hangout chat channel um, from the more focused Q&A format. So there's now a channel there where um, people can ask questions, very specific questions about stuff related to the, to the stream and the project. And I will answer them and I will edit that channel to make sure that uh, it's pretty tight and the hope is if someone do want to, you know, visit the Discord every once in a while, um, they can just go to that channel transcript and kind of see what's been going on without having to scroll through reams of unrelated uh, chatter. Um, and I also am considering, you know, anonymizing that transcript from the Q&A channel and just uh, tracking it in a uh, GitHub, uh, in, the GitHub in the GitHub repository so that uh, you don't have to go to, to the Discord to read that. All right, that, that's it for the sort of practical stream related stuff. Um, I have a kind of a, not a single day homework type problem, but maybe a week long homework problem, depending on, on how people respond to it. Um, so we'll go over that at the end of the stream. And this time I promise I won't uh, close the stream before going over the homework. Um, but uh, I do wanna follow up on a few things people have brought up about um, the code we wrote yesterday. Let's get rid of this stuff. Um, so uh, I guess first a meta a meta thing. Um, people have asked, you know, what's the policy on pull requests uh, and contributions for, you know, kind of small fixes um, and things like that? Because people found a couple of, of small bugs and, and, and typos and stuff like that in the code. Um, and the answer is, because I'll be writing the code live, uh, you can't really expect that anything written within a one or two, like un, un, until we're really committing it to a, a kind of a stable product that 
I expect to stay stable. You shouldn't expect the code to be bug free. I don't know, you know, the, the way I work when I'm writing stuff is there's sort of a frontier of code that, that's in fairly rapid change. Uh, and I try to make sure it doesn't have obvious bugs, but I will miss stuff. Um, but, the, but the way I developed the you know, very debugger driven tends to actually suss out bugs pretty quickly over time. And uh, it's much easier for me to trigger a bug myself, fix it on the spot, re-verify the fix because I just triggered it so I have a test case for val validating my fix, than it is to take sort of typo level fixes, um, you know, like I'll, I'll give an example. Oh, and the other thing is a lot of the time, you know, I won't be pushing my code that I write after the stream until the next day. And so several of the fixes people proposed, I already fixed like a few hours later in my local code when I did another read through. And so the other side of it is, you know, if you submit pull requests uh, for stuff that's in flux, there's a pretty high probability that I already fixed it because I tend to read through code many times when I'm sort of working on it next time. Like my, my style of self-reviewing is always, when I start working on a file, I will read the entire file from beginning to end just to remember and, and kind of look at it with fresh eyes. So I tend to catch those things pretty decently on my own. So what I would say about those sort of um, small scale bugs is uh, please don't submit them if, uh, or don't submit pull requests at least, if they're for stuff I just submitted basically. If it's stuff that's supposed to be in, in stable code, then absolutely submit it. If it's stuff that's been, hasn't been touched in several days, definitely, definitely submit it. Uh, and of course, I reserve the right to reject the pull request or completely change it um, to fit with my style and my uh, my opinions about how to do things. But um, hopefully that makes sense to people. And I'm going to make sure these guidelines are added to a doc in the repo so uh, we don't have to explain it to people over and over. Um, and then in terms of technical stuff, um, I think there were a few questions from people. Oh yeah, actually, let me mention the the, the things that I fixed from yesterday. <laughs> one was a typo, it said malloc instead of x malloc. The other one was that um, um, when you do a free, it now actually nulls out uh, the, 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 the pointer L value, which in semantic terms corresponds to resetting the buffer to length zero. Um, so aside from, I mean, you can think of it as a kind of memory safety thing, but you can also think of it semantically in terms of since a null pointer corresponds semantically to a serial length buffer, free is actually not just free, it's really free and clear, if you will. Um, so yeah, I, I fixed that uh, after the stream finished. Um, I don't think this changed. I added a few more asserts to buff tests. So I added a, an, an initial assert, asserting that the buff lang of a null pointer, of a, of, of a null pointer corresponds to a serial length buffer. Uh, and I added a, uh, to correspond to that change I just mentioned, uh, I added a, uh, a final assert to verify that after the free, uh, well, I guess I should actually also do this. Those, those are equivalent um, in terms of the macro expansion, but they're actually superficially different because one is a statement about um, a pointer in the C sense, and the other is a statement about a, um, you know, a container uh, at a conceptual level, and in particular, it would be totally consistent. It would be possible for this not to, for, for this to fail, but for this not to fail, if, for example, free was implemented with just setting the length to zero. So anyway, so yeah, let's let's add those. Um, uh, one other thing from yesterday is yesterday I had something like this. Uh, I only had the start end range um, for for strings. But I, I mean, I noticed immediately after the stream that um, basically we, sh we should have those for all tokens anyway. So you can actually go and read the original string, uh, the original string um, token. And if we do that, then an identifier doesn't actually need any additional data because it's just you go and read the identifier because there's no escaping or anything like that. The actual uh, lit the, the actual identifier in the stream is, is the value essentially. All right, um, and you can see in order to accommodate that change, I now initialize start at the top of next token. Uh, and when we're done you know, scanning to the end of the token, we set end on the way out of the function. And so now um, the identifier scan is, is not actually doing any 
uh, value or you know it's not setting the start and end it's just part of the the overall flow um, and one thing a bunch of people commented on is that you know this kind of huge switch statement is obviously very uh, well it's a lot of boilerplate it's very ugly why wouldn't I just um, why wouldn't I just do you know uh, something like if you know if is alpha uh, stream then you know do stuff else else if is digit stream you know do some stuff and things like that um, and I mean in theory you could do that just for identifiers in fact one thing I have done before uh, in these sorts of top level switch lexers is I've put it under default so that basically I only do it down here um, and that doesn't hurt I mean that, that's not too bad at all uh, in terms of performance for example and it definitely reduces uh, verbosity but as a general rule of thumb it's a good idea when you're doing something like a lexer a lexer is going to be the bottleneck for well for simple for simple compilers that don't do very heavy weight backend stuff um, a lexer is actually often the bottleneck like because it's one way of thinking this is very simplified and it's not totally true because you can there's various things about the language and the implementation style that, that can make that not true but if you think about it very naively a uh, tokenizer is working byte by byte everything subsequently is working in bigger units like tokens and so there's kind of a at least in terms of the number of discrete units there's a data reduction going on as you go through the pipeline now of course the pieces of data themselves are more are bigger potentially bigger and more complex so it's not necessarily naively true but it gives you kind of an idea of why even though the code for Alexa is very simple it can actually be a performance uh, bottleneck and so it's worth um, you know when there's essentially no meaningful uh, cost to it it's worth kind of doing the right thing and having a big switch like this and let me actually show you why there's a big switch because the switch is not equivalent to a huge cascading if then else uh, chain uh, I mean I, I think this is something C programmers know but uh, there's a bunch of preliminary stuff here we're running unoptimized so so maybe we should uh, look at it optimized to get a better idea <clears throat> Yeah, so even if you don't know x64 assembly, but basically what this amounts to is that it does a bunch of stuff, but ultimately it does an indirect jump based on based on the dispatch value. And it does that using a table. And so the nice thing about this from a low level point of view is that this turns into a single big jump. There is some range checks, um, which for byte dispatch can in theory be avoided by having a bigger table. Um, but it's quite common for these jump table um, code generators to compress it so that it, you know if you know for example well i guess actually so what did it do Let, let's actually read the code um, yeah so it does have this one comparison but it's not too bad but anyway um, and that's kind of an over, I guess, yeah, so anyway, so um, that's why people do it. That's why I do it. You, you will see this a lot in, you know, performance conscious C-lexers. And as for it being kind of ugly, I guess what I would say is that, you know, we generated it with a script. I didn't have to type it. Um, it's, uh, it's the kind of boilerplate that, in all honesty, you know, why I would like to avoid it. Um, it's not really a true code quality issue. Uh, it would be nice if you had GCC style uh, case ranges where you can do, um, you know, something like this. Uh, and it would be nice if C had that feature portably, but it doesn't. And so we're kind of stuck with this if we want to do jump tables. Anyway, so hopefully that at least rationalizes why I'm doing it. You may think that it's still ugly, but sometimes uh, things cannot be perfect in all respects. Okay. Um, I think that's it as far as the the old or, or new things or like stuff I wanted to cover before we actually start doing uh, more programming on this uh, little lexer and, and make it into a parser. So um, um, let's start. God, I really want this thing to not pop up. Um, so right now, let, let's just review what kind of tokens we support. We support single operator token or single character tokens. 
that kind of stand for themselves. We support uh, integer literals and we support identifiers. Um, okay, what would be the right thing to add next? Um, what would be the right thing to add next? Okay, I made the originally I motivated the stretchy buffers by saying we'll be using them a bunch, but specifically first off for uh, for, for string interning. So um, I guess let me give a a minor um, a minor um, spiel on uh, on data structures in C and uh, giving you. Uh, I guess a list of the three things that you can do almost anything with, right? Like if you have these, you can pretty much solve any data structure type problem um, very efficiently, both in terms of you know runtime performance, but also um, you know programmer performance like productivity. So most important is, um, in my opinion anyway, is uh, stretchy buffers, which we already covered. Um, the second one is pointer hash tables, um, which is, you know, let's call it uint pointer hash tables. So essentially uint pointer to uint pointer key value mapping. Uh, and the third one is string intern table, which can actually be built out of the previous two, but you'll want this as a primitive. Um, and, and obviously like, it's not really true that this is all you ever need, but this is like, this covers so much. Um, and so the philosophy, especially when you're doing things that involve parsing and strings, l let me first explain string interning for people who are not familiar with the idea. If you haven't heard about it at all, and this explanation is too brief, uh, go maybe look it up on Wikipedia. The idea behind string interning is you want to canonicalize different uh, representations of the same string contents. So, you know, if I have, um, if I have a string buffer, um, if I have two string buffers that have the same contents, uh, but are not the same pointer, and in C, uh, these two things actually cannot share memory uh, because they're distinct objects. So if I if I overwrite X later, it can't alias with Y. Y has to have its original value. So if you do this in C, uh, if you want to check equality, you have to do something like, like this, right? Um, and uh, I guess it's something like this, right? Um, in order to do equality checking between two specific candidates, you have to walk both of them and actually uh, check that all the characters match in order, right? And, and also that there's no, when you go to the end, that one of the, they're, they're the same length and all terminator is in the same place. So that one is not just a prefix of the other. This is a beginner trap when you're when you're doing this stuff sometimes with uh, stir and comp, for example. But um, but anyway, so that's kind of the way you have to do things if you have to work with uh, string buffers um, generally, and you don't know you know you don't have any canonical representation of different strings. So string interning is really the idea that we want to have a function which I'll I'll call stir intern, um, and this has the property that uh, stir intern x equals star intern y if and only if um, the following is true. Oh, that's not what I want to write. <clears throat> so what does this actually do? It takes a string buffer and it assumes it's null terminated, although we often want to have a version that works on string intervals like substrings rather than null terminated string buffers. But it takes in an arbitrary C string buffer and it returns um, yeah and it returns it returns a, uh, a, a stable pointer. Uh, it returns a stable pointer that is the canonical representation of that string contents. So, the, so if you imagine you, at startup in main, if you do stir uh, intern of foo, basically the first time you do this, it's going to see, hmm, have I seen the, the string foo before? If I haven't, then I'm going to uh, allocate a, an internal copy on demand with the same contents and then return a pointer to that as the return value. Um, but then the next time I call stir foo with potentially a different string buffer containing the string foo, 
I will get back that same originally stored uh, string pointer. So it's a canonical representation of a certain string contents. Now, the reason this is great is that even though this means that when you do the string intern from an arbitrary buffer, uh, you do have to do a linear time uh, and you can accelerate it with a hash time with a hash table and stuff like that. But you know, you, you do have to do like character by character matching at some point to validate a match. But after that point, um, you can uh, once you've canonicalized or once you've interned a string buffer, you can do string equality by just using pointer compare pointer equality. So that's the magic bet: is that up up front when you parse something, you, like you parse an identifier. Uh, or some other, typically you wanted to only do it for shorter strings, but so especially like for programming language identifiers and stuff like that, um, you, you, you intern it. And after that point, you don't have to think of it as a string buffer. You can just think of it as a string pointer, like just an opaque pointer that you can do pointer comparisons on. And so anytime you're doing simple table, table lookups in your compiler to resolve, you know, variable references to variable definitions, at that point, you're not actually doing string lookups, you're just doing pointer looks up, lookups. Does that make sense? Now, the reason this is a really, um, really powerful concept, well, first off, it's nice just based on what I said, I hope, but especially when you combine it with a pointer hash table, it means that if you want to, um, if you want to do a simple table, uh, you intern the string when you read it in the lexer, and then when you're actually doing a name resolution, you you don't treat it as a string anymore. You just treat it as a opaque pointer because everything has been canonicalized based on their string value. So I'm belaboring the point in case this uh, this is unfamiliar to some people. It's it's a really powerful technique. Um, it's a special case of something more general called hash consing uh, from Lisp, which is also very powerful. Um, but but string interning in particular in C is kind of a magic bullet for a lot of stuff. It both simplifies your code. It means you have less code to write. You don't have to do str str comps and all this stuff all over the place. Less error prone, and it has a very nice feature, which is that um, you know almost all true almost all the true parsing happens at the boundary of the system. So you have input coming into the system from a user, right? Like a source code file or a prompt or in a UI, it might be you know like a text field. And at the at the point of entry, there's a fairly there's like a like a membrane, there's a hard boundary where the string buffer crosses and turns into a canonical string pointer. And from that point onward, as long as you're within the system that agrees about the fact that things are canonicalized with string interning, you can just do everything with pointers, opaque pointers rather than string values. Um, so this specific combination of of uh, pointer hash tables and string interning is uh, like I would say one of the, the most powerful ideas you can do in general and certainly specifically when dealing with parsing and those kinds of tools. So with that out of the way, let's actually implement, we'll, we'll defer um, the pointer hash table. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do it later this, I guess I want to do more parsing rather than just uh, data structure stuff, but I'll, I'll do the string interning, which will build on the stretchy buffer for now. And, uh, and then we'll actually use the string interning to do, for example, keyword matching. So that when we've parsed an identifier, we can check whether it's a one of the reserved words and match that to a token or something like that, rather than just identifying it as a general name. All right, so let's just jump right in. Um, so I already gave the API, and I'm just gonna put it here. Uh, so the API is um, stir intern, and I'm just going to write the null terminated version first. Um, actually, I won't. Um, I'll write this version first because that's what we actually need in the uh, in the lexer. Because you know, in the lexer we have this start end, and uh, you know that's. Uh, that's actually what we want to pass in to intern it rather than a null terminated buffer. So uh, this is what we'll be passing in. And so what, what, what does this have to do? Well, I'll do a very simple non-scalable version first, just using the stretch buffer rather, and, and linear search rather than a hash table. And that will work functionally. Uh, and then when we do a hash table at some point, 
uh, it will just be a drop-in replacement. It won't affect the string interning API. That's it's just an implementation detail. So um, this is going to be a global interning uh, idea. Um, this is really convenient. It also has systems to sign issues if you know if it's multi-threaded or um, you know, it can have kind of memory leak type issues if it's for long running programs rather than batch mode programs like compilers. Um, it has various kinds of issues you have to be mindful of. And if those issues are really important for you, there are various additions and changes you can make. But for us, um, the right choice is a global string intern table, both for convenience and, uh, I mean, mainly for convenience because it fits our, our problem space for now. And if we need to, we will refactor it later to, um, make it you know make have an explicit string intern table pointer we pass in when we intern rather than just having that be implicit but anyway so uh the intern table is basically just going to be um let's call this intern stir it's going to be a um a, a string buffer i guess i'll actually call this stir um, and we'll put in a length just to be nice. Um, and I think that's it. Then we're going to have a buffer of these. Um, and I'm just going to call these interns. And I'll make it, I'll, I'll write static just to emphasize that this is, I could also actually make it a function static, but I think we'll want to have a different API in addition to this this one for an alternated string. So I'll just leave it like that for now. Note that I'm not zero initializing it, even though it's going to be used as a stretchy buff because it's a global, which are zero initialized by default. Um, all right, so what's the idea? Well, we're going to treat this like a stretchy buff. So what that means is when someone comes in and says, hey, uh, actually, maybe we'll we'll do this um to do some some early out filtering so yeah let's compute the length from the from the string range and let's do a um just a search through that table and <clears throat> so what are we going to do we're going to see if there's any matches and um we will do that by um checking that the length match and doing a stir comp on the strings. And if those match, and actually I can't do that. It has to be start and then length, len. And this is, by the way, one of the traps I mentioned. Remember when you use stir and comp, it doesn't really mean treat one of the strings as a string range. It means only check the first n characters uh, and so this will actually do prefix matching. <clears throat> and so you actually have to validate the lengths are truly the same to get a true string match check. All right, so if, if those match, then you just wanna return the, um, the associated string pointer. And uh, what we will do is, okay, so if, if, we go, if we get all the way to the end of this loop without uh, returning, it means that there was no match in the table. And so at this point, we um, we need to make a new intern, and it's going to have that length. And we're going to, and we will revisit this later with better efficiency, both in terms of runtime and, and storage loca I mean, in terms of all kinds of things. Um, but I don't want to get in the weeds for that now. I just want to do a stir dupe. So I'm just gonna. Can I even? I guess I can't do stir dupe on a on a range. So um, let me um, let me malloc it. Um, and it's going to be plus one because we'll, uh, even though, yeah, this is an important little note, I guess. Even though we'll be passing in a string range, which is not necessarily null terminated, we definitely want the contents of our table to be null terminated because they'll be passed around as general C strings, uh, you know, to print out, you know, to various functions that expect null terminated strings. Um, so um, we will do that. And then uh, we will just do a copy. 
Let's see if that makes sense. So as many bytes as there are in the range, plus one for the null terminator, copy over the, the, the range, um, and then null terminate. All right. Uh, and then we have to actually put this in the table. And we're just going to use buff push, which is our stretchy buff um, pushback type thing. So push back, uh, buff push interns, and then um, we're going to use a compound literal. Uh, and we're just going to say um, len and stir. Uh, and one small note here, I guess. Um, you might be tempted to, rather than do this, oops, do something like this and kind of in the string intern and entry directly, uh, you know, kind of just concatenate all the strings like back to back in a huge flat buffer using the length field in order to skip over entries. Um, the, the one of the problems with that uh, is that it won't. When we have to reallocate the, the 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 stretchy buffer when it has to grow, all the string pointers would become invalidated. So remember, one of the constraints is that the pointer has to be stable because there's no lifetime management for the intern table, or if there is, it's some sort of global stir intern free kind of function rather than fine grained. Uh, allocation and freeing. That's what makes this, this is one of the things that makes this so convenient when doing string processing in C, but it does mean that you have to be, have to observe this constraint about stable pointers. That's why we do a, uh, a separate malloc for the, uh, for the string, but it should be mentioned that it would be very easy to just allocate all of these stable string buffers out of a big linear array, uh, like with arenas or something like that. We just have to make sure we never have to reallocate existing storage, but we could use well, I mean, it's an advanced, more advanced topic we'll get to, another, to, to a later point, but we can use arenas or some other custom allocator to speed this up. But for now, this gets the point across, I hope. So anyway, um, let's do this. And then for now, let's just do a slow, um, a s slower uh, than it needs to be. Um, Uh, null terminated version, especially for testing, this will be probably a nice thing to have. Um, and so the reason I say this is slower is, I mean, it probably doesn't matter much, but we're going to be first computing the string on demand, uh, the string length on demand, when we could really uh, kind of discover, we, we could rewrite this whole loop to work more efficiently with null terminated strings rather than computing the length separately. But for now, we're just going to do this. Let's see if it compiles. Um, Oh. Too many actual parameters. I guess we're not bracketing the macro definition correctly. Um. So X occurs and that doesn't really make sense because I think I already bracketed that thing. Okay, that was it. So I'm just not, that's odd. Oh gosh, I forgot. It's because, yeah, this is one of the annoying things. Um, it's a C preprocessor, uh, not knowing about curly braces, so it, it interprets. Oh God, yeah, this is okay. So this is a definite downside of macros. Um, you have to do stuff like this. But for, I mean, hmm. yeah, we'll we'll use it. So in case you guys don't know what what was happening, it's because this comma here is not is treated as a third as the separator for a third parameter because the C preprocessor is a moron and only does parenthesis counting for um, figuring out delimiters for parameters. Also notorious with uh, with templates. If you have a multi-parameter template inside a macro uh, argument list, uh, it's going to have the same problem. 
And unlike that case, you can't, in that case, you actually can't parenthesize it syntactically, legally. So anyway, um, yeah, let's, um, yeah, okay, let's leave it like that. But the, the, I'm a little bit upset about that, but we'll live with it for now. All right. So let's write a little test thing. Um, by the way, when you use this kind of poor man's testing approach, make sure you put dependencies earlier so that if you see a failure in intern, it's not because something basic broke in buff, for example. Um, all right. So let's literally just do the example I just did. Um, So we will verify that these pointers are not the same, but if we intern them, they should be the same. Oh, shouldn't be running in release. Okay, so. So the length of the string is five, which for hello is correct. Um, the buffer is empty, the string, so there's nothing to check. Uh, we allocate five plus one for the, get that back. Let's look at this in the debugger. And that looks null terminated, just to verify I'll do this. Yep, null terminated. Um, and then that gets pushed, let's just step in. Um, okay, so that fails. Um, let's call them PX. Um, so we can see them more easily. Good, good general uh, idea, by the way. If you want to look at stuff in the debugger, break it into separate lines like this uh, and separate variables, so you can more easily see the intermediate values. Otherwise, you're just gonna, you know, you're not gonna have enough context to easily see what's going on. Oh. We didn't actually return anything. I guess I should read my warnings. Why didn't, why wasn't there a warning? That's insane. Okay, now I actually should read that warning. I need to set up things if I can actually, okay, that was a good one. Okay, so that actually works. Um, I'll make sure some prefix thing doesn't cause issues. This should be x malloc. Those are not the same string pointer. Um, so this is extremely basic test, but it's basically just taking the specification and um, kind of writing, I would say just about the simplest, um, you know, very non-exhaustive excuse me, very non-exhaustive uh, test cases. Namely, uh, things that are string-wise the same should get the same pointer, 
but of course you could get that by returning the same pointer for every string. And so in order to rule out that case, at least uh, in one instance, we uh, we chose a different string and verified that we don't get the same pointer back in those two cases. And in addition, this plays a little bit of double duty because it's a suffix uh, or it's a, a string extension of the other strings. So in case we screwed up uh, this check here, um, it would actually uh, it would actually break. Uh, it would it would alias those two things. So um, so even though this is pretty minimal, I. I think this is enough that we can actually start using it. And then, you know, the most obvious bugs, uh, at least, uh, I think we just squashed and then we'll maybe run into more, but you know, with the way we're developing and debugging and stuff, it will generally be very easy to identify and fix things at the point of failure. So that's how I like to do things sort of when things are in flux and I'm, and I'm just uh, working things out. Um, all right. So now what we'll want to do is Um, let's see. And this is a case where actually we want more than just the start and end, but I'm going to leave the start and end uh, anyway, just because I think that's useful to have for all tokens, just so we can print out their literal value in the stream. Um, but we are going to add now a, um, I mean, I guess I'll call it name, because this is going to be the intern name for an identifier. Um, and what it will do is it will intern the range from token start to where we are. And so since we already have code that's testing this code path, we don't have to go and write anything. Let's just look at it and, uh, and see what happens. Okay, let's see what happened there. All right, so it interned the string underscore hello one. Um, I'm not gonna continue. I want to do a, another test in kind of immediately, which is uh, actually, and let me, let me make it even shorter. Let me say X, Y, uh, and then another X, Y. So X, Y is going to be a name, uh, and X, Y is going to be another identical name, and I want to make sure that these are actually, um, they get the same pointer value when interned. So and I guess another thing that would be good to do is, um, let's see, we should have a watch expression for the buffer. So we can also just inspect it. Um, unfortunately, we can't do buff len in here. So let's do, uh, we would have to write the math manually. Let's see. I mean, there's no way this is, it, it's going to actually, let me make that wider. So this is hard coded 64 bit offsets. So we take the bytewise pointer for the interns buffer, we subtract off two times eight, which is the offset on 64 bit. Um, and we cast it and then we want to read it. And so the length is one. And so if we put that in this notation, yep. So. So do you see how nice it is to be able to use watch expressions for these sorts of dynamic buffers? I mean, it would be nice if I didn't have to write this at all. Uh, and I think you can do some special, like, I don't know, NatViz code and VS to automate this, but it's nice that you can just kind of bang this out on demand anyway. Um, so you can see there's one entry. And so basically what we want to verify is that the next time through, um, you shouldn't get a new entry. Okay, so you can see we got back the same thing and you can also see the buffer didn't grow because the watch window updates as we step, right? So we would have seen longer, a longer set of things otherwise. Um, and let's go down here. And now you can see, uh, didn't stay unfolded, but you can see the buffer actually, I should scroll it back like this. 
you can see the buffer actually uh, grew. Let's just look at the the other cases. Okay, this is really annoying that it keeps collapsing the tree view. Who? And that's it. So um, that's already basic string interning. Um, so what do we want to do with that? Well, uh, I mentioned we'll be using it in symbol tables uh, all over the place, not just in, in this initial uh, prototype, but pretty much in every 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 time in the future we do anything related to parsing, we'll use these sorts of techniques for identifiers uh, to canonicalize them and make it easy to compare them. But um, in addition, it's convenient. Let me uh, let me give an example. What's the easiest way to do it? Okay, let me, uh, let's say we want to, let's say we, we write a uh, is keyword uh, function. And I'm, in the final, when we get a little bit further, this will be done with a hash table lookup. Um, where we will enter in all the strings corresponding to reserved, you know, reserved words, keywords in the language, and we will do a pointer hash table lookup to check whether a identifier we've parsed is actually a reserved word, and if so, we will tag it accordingly for the parser to be able to distinguish reserved words from from other things. Although the, compi the compiler could also just do, yeah, and maybe we'll do that. Could just do pointer comparisons between, you know, a given name and the expected keyword. But anyway, for now, let's. Um, Maybe we'll do that, yeah. Yeah, so imagine we're doing this, um, keyword if. Um, and essentially what you're going to do is you're just going to, to intern your reserved words. And I don't know, you know, you can, I mean, add a, add a few if you want to feel accomplished, I guess. Um, but yeah, you get the idea. Um, and now, if you're writing a parser, you know you would you could do something like if if uh, is token um, name keyword if um, this is an uh, parse uh, as an if statement, you know, so we, so we could do, we could do this, something like this. And I'll start writing a parser in a bit, so maybe this kind of thing will make more sense. But the point is, but having interned them when we're doing parsing, we can do these token checks um, by, not by doing string value comparisons, but by doing pointer comparisons, so they're extremely cheap. Um, does that, I hope that makes sense. I'm just going to look at the stream for questions be, before I move on to writing a parser using this stuff because uh, it's a kind of a, I think, a fairly straightforward but an important technique, and I want to make sure people uh, kind of understand my rationale and, and some of the implementation choices. So we're just going to catch up on chat for a few minutes. Uh, tag me with the at sign if you want me to see it. Otherwise, I may miss your questions. So I see comments, but not questions or specific questions. So let me just uh, see if I can find anything.
Um, has it already been 40 minutes? Jeez, can't believe how long that stuff took. Oh, day two, sorry, let me uh, update the quickly. Can't remember what I, okay. So why am I using string interns? Uh, I mean, I kind of talked about that at the beginning. It's so that you can canonicalize string buffers into pointers and just do pointer comparisons rather than string buffer comparisons with stircomp. And in particular, you can do pointer hash table lookups, which is extremely fast and, and easy to work with. Um, it's already been an hour. I do want to do more, start doing parsing stuff. So I promise that even though we've already gone one hour, I'll actually uh, maybe go another full hour. Um, when, when I have to talk while coding, all this stuff takes longer. Uh, someone's asking if I would recommend using this technique in most languages, or is it just C? Well, most languages, well, not most, a lot of languages actually do this in, in the language implementation. So if you have immutable strings as a language level uh, thing, like Python, Java, I don't think Java interns strings by default. Python, no, I guess Python doesn't. It, sorry, Lua, Lua does string interning for all strings, I think, which is sometimes a problem for huge strings. Um, so, but anyway, languages, certainly languages that do interning like Lua, you kind of get it for free. If you do what you think is a string comparison, it actually turns into a pointer comparison. Um, but yeah, if you're writing a program, if you're writing any language tool and performance is an issue, you should definitely try to um, to do that. I should mention that there's another, there's a thing that Python does, which is not quite interning, um, but has much of the same effect, which is that when uh, when strings are constructed, it stores a hash of the string next to the string buffer, which means that even though it will still take linear time to validate a match, um, you can dis you can, you can you can falsify matches by just doing a point a hash comparison and seeing that the hashes don't match, and you can also use the hash directly as a key in a hash table. So you're always I mean you always have to in that case do a, a full linear time match between two candidate strings but the hash can cut down the set of candidates to hopefully one or two if you have a hash table. Um, so in a language like that, there's not much value to doing this. Uh, you, should, you should understand your language implementation with respect to those sorts of performance characteristics before you make a choice of, of, of whether to do manual interning or whether to just lean on whatever built-in features are available. Um, Someone's complaining about a warning on line 95. Non-standard extension. Um, the, the, the stuff I'm using here is C99, so I don't know um, what it's complaining about. It depends probably on your Visual Studio version. It's probably complaining about the, uh, the compound literal, which is a C99 feature. If you're compiling it as C++, that would also be a problem because it's not a C++ feature, which is one of the big gaps in C++ in my opinion, but I think they're trying to add it in at some point uh, for plain C structs, I mean. Um, why not just use a stretchy buffer instead of the intern stir struct? The intern stir is just containing um, the string. I mean, I, I could make it, um, yeah. I mean, so I'm not sure I understand. You mean just put it, I mean, it is a st stretchy buff. It's a stretchy buff of these things. Um, I could just have it directly. I mean, I guess I could do, s s if I wanted to get rid of the length field, I could do just this, um, essentially just removing this and removing the wrapper struct. But um, it's nice to have the length there. And eventually we might want to have a hash, a hash value, maybe like a pre-computed hash um, when we're doing hash table lookups. Um, all right. Buff zero as a non-standard extension. So someone's saying that, anyway, let, let, let's do this after the stream. I don't think it's generally, uh, 
No, but buff zero is a C99 feature. You're just not using a C99 compiler. Okay, hang on. Okay, let's, um, but yeah, you have to use a C99 compiler. Like you're not using a C99 compiler. So there's a big difference. Certain very valuable features are not available. This feature here is cosmetic, but we'll be using other stuff all the time. So make sure you have a C99 capable compiler. Uh, don't compile your code as, as CPP files or as whatever, because uh, many of these things are not uh, available in C++ at the time of, of yeah, currently. All right. Um, Let's see. Dun dun dun. Right. So maybe um, let me write some more. Actually, let me start writing. Um, I mean, this. I guess you could see it as a spoiler for the homework. So this is a little bit painful to have to write. Um, but let me let me show you the standard set of helper functions that, that I use for writing parsers in C, and then let's write an expression parser. And if, if I, I can't really <laughs> avoid doing that at this point, so I'll just do it. And hopefully, you can either not watch this part of the stream if you really want to work on it your own before you see some some other thing that may may kind of spoil the solution. Um, but in any case, uh, if you've had a chance to think about it but maybe haven't fully solved it. Um, this should be hopefully informative. So anyway, um, one thing that's very useful. So right now we have this next token function, which just updates the current token. Um, when we're parsing, we will want to be doing a bunch of operations that involve token matching. Um, and I'll make a bunch of these. I, I won't use smackers for these. Um, and there will be things like, you know, is token. And I'll maybe even make this force in line at some point because it's a one-liner. Um, it's going to be is token, which just does, you know, just checks whether the kind is what you expect. It's going to be something like is token name, um, where you check that the token is indeed a name, and you validate that the name in question matches as a pointer the thing we passed in. So this is the interning thing coming into play. Um, and what else? Um, I should mention I use I think I use standard bool, right? If I didn't include that immediately. Um, right. And another very useful one is expect token. And expect token is it uh, it does an is token check. And uh, if the token is what we expect, then we advance the token and we return true to say, hey, we matched. Otherwise, we return false. And oh, sorry, no, that's right. That's match token. So match token, um, match token doesn't error out if there's not a match. It just it does a it tries to see if there's a match and if there is, it consumes the token, returns true to indicate, and this should be false, um, and so on. There's also expect token when you're not trying to just see. So you're not just trying to do look ahead predictive parsing. You're actually like there has to be a certain token in a certain situation, uh, and this is where you use expect, and uh, it has basically the same shape. Um, but um, doesn't have a return value. Um, actually, let's make it have a return value because eventually we'll want to be able to recover uh, from from errors. Uh, so we will want to be able to maybe detect it for partial recovery. So let's just do the same general shape uh, with the same return values. Um, but the difference is that. Um, We'll have some kind of fatal error uh, for the um, for the um, fatal error for the match. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about: Do we want to do a 
a thing for this. Um, sure. So yeah, expect a token. Uh, I need to get token name. Uh, get token. Describe token. Um, oh, ex expect a token. Um, let's see, token kind name. Um, token kind name. So we expected this got this. Let's see. So we expected um, expected this, and we got uh, and we got this. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm not thinking about this. I'm thinking I had two steps. Um, let's just call it. I don't like the getter stuff. Um, and then return false. So this is a variadic function. That's why I was thinking ahead. Um, this is going to be useful when developing. We don't want to use a search for this stuff. Uh, fatal errors in the final compiler are going to be too harsh because it means that as soon as, as, soon as there's any failure, it's going to just halt compilation and not continue and try to recover more of the structure uh, of, of the code. But during development, the fatal error approach is a good way of still doing error handling and being able to um, for example, catch it in the debugger, but at, in a non-debug build, uh, still print a nice error message and, and exit out. So let's let's do a this kind of fatal function for for doing this stuff. And I'm going to put all these general utility functions that don't really have anything to do with parsing per se at the top. So um, fatal is going to be a printf style function. Um, so I guess we need stodarg. And um, okay, so we'll be doing. Um, I can never remember what it's called. VA list args VA start AP argument pointer. No, that's not what I want to do. Okay, I can't remember what, I mean, the argument pointer is presumably format, but I, I, I'll go verify. Um, no, so, okay, so the argument pointer is arcs. What was the other name? It's end. And I should, I'm, I'm not going to use, this is going to be unsafe in the first version, and I plan to use stretchy buffers for buffer management, um, persistent temp buffer management that can't overflow. For now, this is going to be um, potentially overflow uh, unsafe code, and I'm just going to put a big fat warning for us to look at later. Um, so this will be like, you know, error buff. Um, and this is going to be format, and this is going to be the args. Um, and for now, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be like, let's make it a meg. Um, and so, I guess I don't even need to do that. We're just printing to standard IO. See, this is the thing. I kind of, all right, let's just use vprintf. I, I like to, on Visual Studio, you have to use output debug spring, string to have a good workflow in the debugger, but let's just use printf for now so we don't have to worry about that. Um, format arg list. Yes, yeah, so we just get rid of the above. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> and then we'll do we'll do this. 
we'll do a nice new right a new line afterwards and then we'll do exit one kind oh okay so okay so we have to do this This is going to be It's not a very safe technique, but um, we'll use it for now um, and do a better job later. And so we're just going to have an internal uh, buffer, and you know we can make it I don't know, 256. Um, and then we switch on the kind, and um, we have a token int. We're not going to do a very good job, so we're just going to do a store copy to the buffer from um, You know, I'll, I'll do sprint up for consistency uh, because we may want to add some additional stuff afterwards. Um, so sprint f buff, and then what was the thing, right? Um, if um, let's see, if kind is less than this and is printable. Um, Then we print it as ASCII. Otherwise, we will um, we will use this kind of notation. Okay, there's that defined. <laughs> Getting all these weird tie things. This printable, what is that function called? Oh, it is this print. I thought it was a contraction for some reason. Okay, and I'm not actually returning the buffer. Which would be a good idea. Um. All right. So let's just review because I just flushed my cache of the stuff we wrote here. Um, is token kind and it does just a straight up check. Does a kind check and then a pointer quality check for the name. Match try sees if the token is the expected thing and then consumes it and returns a tree accordingly. This is the same kind of thing, but fails in a hard way otherwise. Um, and so let me give you a simple example of how you might use this for an expression parser. 
you don't have to use these for a very small parser, but uh, I promise you when you're writing a bigger parser, having kind of nice names that encapsulate recurring patterns like this is going to be a gold mine compared to doing hacky, you know, token.kind equals whatever all over the place. Uh, because it, writing it this way is almost going to read more like a grammar, right? Like you can kind of look at it and see the isomorphism to an EBNF or something like that. All right, so um, let's say we want to parse an expression. Um, and I guess our grammar is going to be something like um, um, and actually, let me use the regex notation for char classes. Um, I'm just going to do plus minus uh, multiply divide, but you can add all the other precedents, uh, the other things that were in the homework from, from uh, to, to those precedence levels. So you're going to take these, and then you're going to do a left fold over over that. Um, and I'm using the clean, the clean star for repetition. Um, and so this corresponds to the lowest precedence level of expression. And this is the one above that, which is going to be multiplication. Um, and it has the same pattern. Um, why is the syntax highlighting? Oh, God. C++, please. Or C, rather, because it, OK, let's do that. I guess it doesn't work either, right? Because you can't have nested. Uh, wait, I thought you couldn't have nested. Can you have nested uh, block comments in C99? I'm just going to leave it like that for now. We're going to delete this later, I think, just for me to write out. Um, so anyway, like this. And then I guess for unary, um, we will have uh, optional minus, unary minus. Um, and then at the top, we will have um, we will either have a a number, an int, or a um, or an expression. I'm just going to write these uh, sort of. Actually, let me use this notation. I'm going to use um, here's my notation for tokens in a EBNF grammar. All caps refers to refers to named tokens and i'll ma make them match the 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 ones we have in the c code so int is token underscore int that kind um for, for things that sort of stand for themselves like all these single character things for example i'm just going to use this sort of single quote notation so hopefully that's clear that's the token that the single character token that has an open paren uh, and then it's going to be expression and then this and then this is going to be something like this um and so the idea here, if you want to, so this, this, so this is where recursive descent makes it really easy to think about parsing and then kind of operational, like thinking like a machine operationally. So an expression, to, to parse an expression, we try to parse a bottom level precedence expression, which means we first we first do an expert one. And because expert one will consume all the higher precedence stuff, by the time our call to the parsing function for expert one returns, it's already consumed any higher president stuff like a divide or a multiply and so on. And so by the time we return, we're already past all of those higher presidents operators in the stream. And hence, when we match uh, these next, uh, the, the presidents works out right. Uh, and in addition, because we're writing, um, we're writing this not with recursion, but with repetition. So it's a left fold uh, iteration rather than recursion per se, although you could look at it as a, as a tail recursion if you really wanted to. Um, this actually does left associative parsing. So sometimes when you see people talk about operator precedents, they're so stuck in the recursive mindset that um, they think you have to sometimes eliminate the left recursion, which is what seems to, um, if you write it naively in a sort of, you know, if you're a functional programmer, you're very used to recursion, you would probably write an expression grammar with left recursion in order to get left associativity. 
uh, which is then you can't parse predictively easily without backtracking or some kind of pre-processing. Um, and so instead, you often see people doing right associative parsing, but then do a transformation on the AST in order to effectively make it left associative. So all of that stuff is totally overblown. Here's how you do it. I'll show you the C code in a second. I mean, I may have made some typos here, but that, we'll find that out when we test it. But that's this is the this is how you do it. All right. Um, and so even though this is not really going to do anything other than uh, defer, I'm, I'm going to make it as, even though I'm not, I'm, I really hate this style, I think in order to make evident the relationship between the grammar and the functions, I'm going to do that. Um, so let's see, what did we do in expert zero? Well, we parse an expert one, and then we have to see whether to match this stuff. And we will do that if, you know, because the look-ahead symbol for this is one of, is, well, in this case, plus and minus, it's one of these two symbols. So essentially what we'll be doing is while is token um, plus or is token minus, um, You know, and I'll do it like this. So we'll have a common guard, but then we have to remember what operator it actually was. And we'll just start that in a char because we know it's one of these ASCII literals. Um, and then we simply, well, actually, in this simple parser, I guess we're not actually computing a value. So we'll do that right after. But let's just do the recognition and then we'll do the calculation later. Uh, but I'll just start off in any case. Um, so let's see, sorry. Um, sorry, my wife just came in, so it interrupted me. Let me just get my tra train of thought back. Uh, so what are we doing? We store this off and then we, we recurse and we keep doing that as long as there's another of these look ahead symbols. Okay. So then the pattern is identical. This is not expert two. Of course, it's expert one. And we store off. And again, there's there's more efficient ways, so you don't have to do two checks, but you can only do one check using a table. Kind of like I mentioned yesterday for the lecture stream, we will do that later. And right now, I'll be writing the thing that is most isomorphic to the grammar, and we'll do the the, the cool engineering tricks later uh, when when uh, all this stuff has has sunk in. So we do that, and finally. Here it's, we just have to see whether um, there's a token. Oh, sorry, I, I, did, I did a mistake. Um, if you could use this token, actually that's not a good idea because I need to store off the token. That's probably why I didn't do it. So you, you, want, you, you want to do this. So you want to, you do the look ahead, you store off the symbol, and then you consume it, and then you parse recursively. Same idea here. Um, here we can just use match token because there's only uh, there's only one option. It has to be a unary prefix uh, minus. Um, I'll do this in separate branches because then we can do separate stuff when we do actual calculations. Um, and then finally, expression three. Um, if we have an int, a token int, um, we're just going to, for now, we're just going to say yay because we're not actually calculating anything. So, um, you know, we're just going to consume it because we're not actually making a structure or calculating anything, but we're just recognizing it. 
and uh, otherwise, um, else if, um, else if match token, um, then we, we go back up to the top. So you can see all of these are back references, but expert three has a forward reference. So the whole thing is recursive. Not just, you know, it's not just a deferment, there's actual recursion, there's a whole loop because of uh, of this thing. All right, so match that token and then expect the closing parenthesis. And if it's neither of the two, we're just gonna say expected integer or this got um, let's see if that compiles. So we have to forward declare that. Okay, that works, or at least it compiles. Uh, this is the kind of thing, by the way, we should probably have an expect tokens type of thing, you know, like where you can specify multiple tokens. Once we do something more table driven for some of these match uh, clause matches, uh, we can also use that same kind of bit set functionality to, you know, have a general error reporting mechanism when you have more than one expected token. So we don't have to write this kind of stuff out ourselves by hand. Uh, and there's probably bugs in this, but let me just do a read through and then we'll write a test case. Okay. Let's re rearrange the line order. Uh, so this lex test is closer to the actual lexer code. Even though I'm using one source file, I do like to have sort of uh, consecutive chunks of stuff um, just for, for keeping th separate things separate. Uh, so the parse test. Um, I mean, let's let's start really simple with a single thing. We should probably actually call it. That would be a good idea. Oh. Um, uh, we should make a function for that. after next token Let's get ours, um, our watch expression set up. So I always want to know the current token. So we can see the current token is an int, but we want to make sure it, so it just goes down the tree. It's not, yeah, okay. This is one reason why single stepping is sometimes annoying with these inline functions. In debug is that there's too much stuff you're stepping over, but I should just have used step over rather than step into. It's my fault. Um, okay, so it didn't match that, and uh, it did correctly do this. And now it's going to detect the EOF. And so at this point, none of those things are going to match because it's a null. 
And so now we're done. Yay, that was the first thing. Let's try to do simple parenthesized. And actually, I'm going to do um, Um, it's just it's a very little bit of boilerplate to factor out, but this way we can do we can do something a little bit more short like this. So let's just verify that this still works. Um, and actually, let's let's make let's, this is always a good test. Make sure you have negative tests, like in other words, stuff that doesn't um, stuff that that may that introduces an error. So uh, let's just make sure this hits the R case. Okay, that's definitely not what I want. Uh, what? I think I hit the wrong step key. Okay. Right. So, okay. So I should have just opened my console window and seen that immediately. But anyway, it's always good to step single step through code just to sort of force your brain to work through the details. But yeah, so that it definitely detected that error. Um, let's say what was it? Test parse expression. So yeah. Um, let's do. So we have the one. And I. The print token stuff is obnoxious. You don't want tests to print stuff like this. I'm just going to remove it for now um, because it's gunking up my. Uh, let's just retest. It's gunking up my console window. Good. Actually, an easier way. This is a good use for permanent breakpoints. Um, setting a permanent breakpoint here. <clears throat> right, so we can see that. Okay. So let's actually do what we started to do. Um, verify that this works. So this should match the integer. And then it's just going up the stack. And then it correctly, well, it finds the expected close paren and all is peachy keen. And it unwinds the stack and we are done. <clears throat> okay. Let's do something like this. Right now we don't have white space. Uh, you know, it, it, we don't we don't ignore white space. Um, but anyway, so that was the simple version. I just wanted to make sure that it doesn't blow up. Now I'm going to turn it into an evaluator. Actually, I kind of gave that as homework today. So actually, let me show that on stream because there's too much homework anyway. So this will be a good, um, this should be a good <laughs> starter. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change these parse functions to actually return the result of evaluating. Um, and basically what we're going to be doing is this is going to be the right value recursively. Uh, and then depending, depending on whether this is plus or minus, um, you're going to either do a left, well, it's going to be a left fold in all cases, but it's going to be something like this. Um, Oh, and I should actually finish the function, then you want to return that. So that's a left fold that corresponds to the grammar structure. And then So return it. I guess for for this, we can make it. We don't need this variable. We can just kind of directly do this. Um, when we match a parenthetical, we will just do this and then return the value here. Um, and of course, we will do. Let's see. So boom, boom, I guess we will do is a token dot val. But we have to do that up here before we consume it. And then we can return. Um, we don't technically have, I mean, our value is actually u int 64, uh, but we're calculating it like this. I guess let me change that. Um, even though we can, even though right now we can only read unsigned literals, we can compute with signed literals when we do subtraction, for example, and negation. Um, it should be int 32 because let's just make it an int. Um, okay. Let me just do a quick test read before we actually run the code. Uh, so let's see here. Recursively get this value, and then if the look ahead matches, we store that off, consume the token, recurse on the higher precedence level, dispatch on the type of to operator, and then left fold with the right operation, depending on, um, you know, de depending on these things, return the value at the end. Uh, and this template is the same. Let's see. Of course, this could be divided by zero. So if you want to be, I guess, a good person, you could do this maybe. I mean, it will fail probably with an exception, but it's good to make explicit that you're a smart programmer who thinks of edge cases and expresses them explicitly in your code, even if you don't handle them and just write a lazy assert like I'm doing. OK. Um, OK. but. I mean, it probably has some issues, but it would be a, a good start. Um, so let's see, this should be one. This should also be one. This should be, let's see, one minus two is minus one, minus three is minus four.
Okay, that worked. Let's do some precedence checks. Um, two times three plus four times five should be, let's see, uh, I still get mental math. So six plus 20 is 26. This is where I probably embarrassed myself. Okay, that worked. We should also verify that um, just standalone unary negation works. It does. Um, and then we'll verify that it binds correctly. So for example, if you do plus minus three, uh, that should actually be equal to minus one, I guess. It does. Um, let's do some left, well, we, we did left associativity tricks here. Um, maybe let's do it, yeah. No, I, I, I kind of believe it based on this. Um, let me see if there's any other coverage. Like plus and minus are kind of symmetric, so I don't feel like doing a lot of testing for plus is very interesting. Uh, minus is the one that reveals associativity issues, and we check that. Um, I mean, we we don't have a way of asserting that certain errors occur, so I'm not going to... The way we're structuring things right now, it's hard to say I expect an error to happen when I pass this expression, and this is the kind of error I expect to happen. That's actually something you want in a real compiler test sheet, but in this kind of very nascent state, uh, it's hard for us to to do automatic testing for expected errors. Uh, because we're just asserting and you know uh, we're using asserts to us you know so it's it's not great but anyway uh, I think that's actually it let me well actually let me do some parenthesis precedents that's definitely something I missed out on so uh, you should be able to do for example uh, if you oops, if you take this case up here and instead of just leaving it flat you do this then instead you should get what Two times seven is 14. I mean, well, actually, let, let me show you an even better way of doing this. Oh God, this is so nice. I feel proud of myself. Um, Does that work for parenthesized stuff? Let's try. I'm never quite sure how stringification works with some of these things. Um, let's see if this works. Okay. What happened there? I should verify this thing is not just no opping by stepping into something. Okay, so it's actually doing something. All right, I think that's it for the stream. That's an hour and 45 minutes. Um, let me go through homework before I close the recording. Um, and I already did the first part of homework on stream, which I think is good because the second parts are, the feedback I got from people, I, I floated it 
with was that it might be a little, little much in terms of just scope. Um, but uh, let's talk about it now. So, um, Uh, so yeah, it's a multi-part exercise. This might take you quite a while to complete, like maybe it'll take a week. So until I have good, a good sense from people's feedback that they've more or less finished, say, 50% at least, um, I won't even think of doing new homework. But uh, this is sort of a continuation of last time's work. Uh, and at the end, there's a pretty cool payoff. So I hope you guys will appreciate this. I think this will make you fake, feel some sense of accomplishment if you're new to parsing and related topics. So the first thing is implement a calculator by rather than just evaluating the S expression, actually doing the calculation uh, as part of the recursive descent. And that's what I just did. And of course you should yourself, you should be writing tests like this. This is not exhaustive. This is just the kind of stuff I will write as I'm implementing something for the first time for longer term regression testing or other kinds of exhaustiveness test testing. You will want to do different things. Um, but anyway, you, you have to do that yourself too, remember. Um, the next thing is implement a bytecode state machine that corresponds to the set of operators that are in the grammar and their usual meaning in C. Um, and uh, the idea is, you know, a, uh, a bytecode instruction like add has no explicit operands, but pulls its two operands from the top of the stack and adds them and pushes them back on the stack. Um, and there's a literal opcode, which uh, has an explicit operand in the instruction stream. So you have a one byte lit opcode followed by a four byte little Indian integer, and you have to push that onto the stack when lit is executed. And then there's a halt opcode to finish. And so this is a virtual machine, even though a very simple one. And I have some code fragments here that you, just to get you an idea of what, what kind of thing I have in mind, you don't have to do it like I do. Um, there's some discursive stuff here about uh, overflow safety, uh, underflow and overflow safety for bytecode machines. Uh, some more advanced stuff down here if you're pretty hardcore. Not that it's super hard to implement, but it's a, it's definitely a stretch thing you can work on if you're really bored. Um, basic fragment of a bytecode interpreter and you're kind of expected to uh, fill in the blanks like for the other operators and so on. Um, and finally, uh, with this bytecode interpreter or this bytecode virtual machine in hand, uh, go back and make a copy of your old parser that you originally, well, I originally, I guess, wrote a calculator with. And instead of, uh, you know, recursively calculating, uh, you know, the immediate result, I want you to output the bytecode instruction stream corresponding to the expression. So, you know, if I have one plus two, I want you to output lit one, lit two, uh, add and so on and you it has to have the right precedence and everything according to the grammatical structure so this is a compiler uh, and once you've done that you know starting yesterday we wrote a lecture and a parser today i wrote an, a calculator and interpreter actually although a very simple one uh, maybe you'll do it in your own hope you, you should do your calculator with the own version of with the per, version of the parser that you wrote yourself but you can look at my code if, if you get stuck a virtual machine for the bytecode stuff, a compiler that actually targets that VM, and uh, incidentally, you know, the invariant you can use to test correctness is that the interpreter, if you interpret an expression and you compare the result with first compiling and then running on the bytecode VM the, um, uh, the same thing, then you should get the same result. So these are sort of two different implementations of the same semantics, but with different implementation techniques. On the one hand, direct one pass string interpretation. On the other hand, compilation to a bytecode VM and a simple bytecode stack machine uh, that executes it. And so I think if, if you do those, I think you'll see that you know this is a pretty significant uh, set of tools, either, even though the language of expressions, just arithmetic expressions is really tiny. Uh, like I said, this is supposed to be a pretty a uh, big mouthful, not in necessarily in terms of difficulty, although maybe that too, but just like there's several steps. So um, definitely look up stuff on Wikipedia if you don't know what a bytecode machine is. Uh, I have the code here so you can actually see in the code what, the, what it means, but if you want more background, read on Wikipedia. Um, you know, ask questions on the Discord or wherever people are congregating, the forums when that comes up. Uh, I can also answer questions, although, you know, I have limits to my bandwidth for that. 
Um, and yeah, it'll take a while. Also, I, I wrote, wrote this up here. Um, if for any given kind of homework stuff, you don't get more than say 50%, uh, that's not really bad at all. Like a lot of this stuff, because we have so many people of different backgrounds watching, I, I have to have something for both beginners and more expert people. And so there's going to be a range of difficulties and scope. And uh, if you get stuck on something, don't worry, because even the act of working on a problem means that if I work through it on stream, um, you'll have a kind of appreciation for my solution that you wouldn't have had if I just you know, vomited the code onto you and you'd never seen anything like it before. So that's really one of my hopes for the homework. It's not just for you to do stuff on your own. It's also that you'll actually have an ability to learn stuff when I'm just trying to kind of download, you know, how to do things. Like you're not going to be able to really understand that at a deeper level if you haven't tried to solve the problem yourself. So anyway, I think that's almost two hours. Um, I will do Q&A for maybe five, 10 minutes. I don't think I'll do an after stream because this stream today was so long and I'm really hoarse. <clears throat> so uh, let me just read stream chat and answer any questions and then we'll, we'll finish. Uh, Sean mentions that, and this is our correct bug. Good catch, Sean. Um, so, so the sorry. Let, let me repeat his question. Sean is saying, shouldn't the grammar be, uh, shouldn't the grammar be like this rather than this, uh, because that way you can have, you can have stuff like this, which basically means three of three of you know minus minus you know something like this because this is supposed to be right associative. And so that's a good catch. Basically, the way I implemented it here is kind of the pattern for left associativity, which doesn't really work for prefix operators if you want them to be able to stack up. Um, so the correct, uh, the, the, the correct grammar is indeed like this, because then if you see something like this, it's going to see the first, uh, it's going to see the first minus, consume it, and then recurse into itself so it can match another one, and then another one, and then another one. And so, um, good fix or good catch. And then we have to, I think I already made the change here, right? So it's a very small change. Incidentally, this is a nice example of how making a trivial change in the grammar turns into an isomorphic trivial change in the parser. So good catch. <clears throat> Some people are saying the homework looks too daunting. Uh, I guess the other thing I should say is I'm still trying to calibrate myself on what the right kind of work is because I got mixed, you know, I, I'm getting kind of mixed signals from some, some folks. Some people are saying that, you know, this is too easy. I've done it a million times. This is boring. And other people are saying, you know, like, and, and neither of them are necessarily wrong. And, and the other people are saying, you know, this is totally new and very difficult for me. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to structure this stuff in order to be able to have something for both classes of people. Um, so please just uh, indulge me as we figure out the right way of doing these problems in a way that's useful for as many people as possible. Um, Someone's asking what left fold means. <clears throat> that's a very good question. Sorry, that's functional programming terminology, but it's a very useful concept. Um, it's a very simple concept. Suppose you have a list, suppose you have a, actually, let me write it like this. <clears throat> suppose you have an array of integers and uh, you have a function and you have a zero value and then you have a uh, function, uh, which is kind of a binary operator, essentially. 
this may be too abstract. I'll instantiate it in a sec so you can see it in concrete cases. Um, then um, essentially what we'll be doing is something like this. So basically you're taking an array of things and some initial seed value, like maybe it could be zero, and then you're taking a binary operation. And I mean, let, let me make a very concrete example. So, suppose you have a list of integers and you want to compute this uh, result, which is a left, is, is, so this is equivalent, evaluating this is equivalent to, uh, to what we're doing when we're parsing, right? And suppose that's in an array we'll call x's. Uh, the way we would do that is we would do this, and we would do this, and then we would say that's the result. <clears throat> um, so look at what we're doing. We have an array. We have a value. We have an initial value, which is the C up in this very generic version with function pointers. Here it's zero, and um, and then we just iterate from left to right order over the array, and as we go we subtract the new element from the existing values, you know, the, the accumulator we're, we're threading through this loop. And then uh, as, as we finish, we just return that value. So for example, for let's say we're just doing one, two, three, initially we have a value zero. Actually, I guess this would be minus, so let, sorry, let me do it like this. It would actually be minus one, minus one, et cetera. Um, so we would start with zero, then we would see a one, and we would say, well, zero minus one is minus one. Then we would see a two, and we would say minus one minus two is minus three. We would see a three, we would see minus three minus three is minus six. So that's a left fold. It's when you're kind of accumulating with some sort of operator left to right in place, as opposed to a right fold, which I'm not gonna show, it's not very natural for arrays, where you're kind of doing the same thing, but in a rightward leaning. So, so for example, if I parenthesize this, um, well, we actually, if we, if we computed, um, this, this is equivalent to this, if I parenthesize it, but if I do this, it, <clears throat> so that's the difference. It's basically taking a binary operator and, and left associating it which can be done in place when you're parsing things left to right or processing things left to right. It doesn't have to be a parse problem. Right fold is the opposite, which corresponds to right associative operators. So that's kind of the idea. Grammar is broken right now, doesn't you X for three? Oh, I made a typo in the grammar. Well, I deleted the grammar, which is probably, oh, here it is. What did I mean here? It should be, yeah, sorry. It should be either this or this, I guess. Which I think is what I'm already doing in the code, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Okay, so yeah, my code was right, but my grammar wasn't. Um. Uh, I'm waiting a few more minutes for any direct questions, maybe two more minutes, uh, and then I'll I'll shut off the stream because it's been very long and I'm very hoarse. Need some food. I think someone's, I mean, talking about some preference stuff about text editing, uh, text editing while you're debugging or just switching back and forth. I think because I have such a finely interleaved editing and debugging flow, uh, I don't, I, I've tried it. I mean, I use, I'm a, I'm a long-term Emacs user for like 15 years 
and I tried to even write Emacs extensions to e easily flip back and forth and all kinds of stuff to minimize f friction, but it's, it still doesn't really, uh, it still introduces too much friction with the way I like to work. So even though the text editor in Visual Studio is far from great, um, it's not so bad that the debugging experience uh, doesn't compensate, basically. Oh yeah, um, someone's mentioning that there might be, not in the homework, but in the uh, reading that there's a typo in, v in one of in Viet's book. Um, let me just uh, bring it up. Um, what is this? Oh. Um, I think it's this one, which is what page? But anyway, yeah, that's the errata. Um, yeah, it's it's he's a he's using the symbol a a lot on that page with different meanings. I mean, he's redefining it in each case. But then, which is fine if you're good at managing those kinds of symbol meanings uh, when they're changing. But then he actually, I think, somehow made a typo here. Otherwise, I don't see how the expression makes much sense. Uh, because it, like even though this is left recursive, if you look at the other rules. Um, like the the T production is left recursive as well, because this is this is not intended to be a directly predict, uh, L one parsable grammar. This is just an abstract context free grammar. But anyway, yeah. So that's the uh, um, that 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 was the errata. Let me see if there's anything else people brought up. By the way, as for kind of quote unquote solving also yesterday's homework with uh, with me doing the parsing, there's actually a bunch of stuff I didn't do. I didn't do right associative binary operators, although I did do one right associative unary operator. Um, I didn't do this thing where if I asked you to factor out uh, the repetitive structure and I won't tell you how to do it, but let me just tell you what I mean at least. Like, does this look very similar? You know, these are mirror copies except for you know, the specific kind of hierarchy in terms of what is calling what and what, you know, what the specific operation is that's executed, uh, what the, you know, the precedence and the associativity is. In this case, they're all left associative. So the point is, if you look at this and you think about, you know, could I put some of this stuff into a table and then have a single function um, which is driven by that table information rather than hard-coded C code uh, that's kind of what I'm asking you to figure out. That may not be obvious if you haven't seen it before, but I think it's kind of a uh, an aha moment if you can, if you can work it out. So uh, again, that was like I think an extra credit thing, but uh, I haven't shown how to do that. In fact, we won't really be we won't be doing it in our parsers because uh, I, I like having everything exploded out like this when we're doing uh, you know and we have a fixed set of operators. It's not too bad. So anyway, but th that that was my intent with that exercise. So uh, Please do that if, if you didn't get to it and you're uh, feeling bored. <clears throat> uh, someone's asking, am I going to develop within the VM later on when cross-compiling isn't necessary? It uh, depends on what you mean by the VM. Do you mean like if I'm doing a Linux, uh, if I'm testing stuff on Linux, like a desktop Linux uh, VM? Um, Visual Studio nowadays actually has uh, remote debugging for GDB on, on Linux targets uh, working pretty well. Um, so I'm planning on trying that out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm used to using GDB on, uh, on Linux, so I may end up using that uh, if I have to, but I mean, and you can use that from the VS, uh, from the VS workflow as well when you're remote debugging, but um, let's, see what, let's see what we do when we get there. Yeah. <sighs>
All right. I think I'm going to stop the stream. I'm really tired. I need to take a break. Um, as always, if you find any, well, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't feel free to, 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 to give me pull requests for typo level stuff that I'll find tomorrow anyway. Um, but uh, if you have questions, you know, go on the Discord. Um, once we have a forum, go there. But for now, I think the Discord is the best option. But uh, anyway, thanks for today. Uh, I'm actually pretty happy with what we accomplished today, even though it took two hours, and hopefully you guys are too. Uh, if something didn't make sense, try to maybe, I guess, watch the relevant sections again, uh, read the code slowly, kind of on your own time to, to make sense of it. But anyway, that's it for me, and I will see you guys tomorrow.